we decide that we've got to get a deal. They'd done some stuff, a couple of tracks in Sweden or Holland or something. Then they came back and we went to uh, a studio in Soho and we did three tracks, I think. One which was Help. And I took Help to Roy Featherston at EMI. And he said, that's brilliant. Yeah, we should be involved in this band. I said, well, it's got to be an album. It's got to be an album deal. And because I've been working for American labels, I'd worked for Philips, MCA, Decca, all these American things. I didn't understand why we signed all the rights away to an English company. When what happens is if you, if you record for an album for an English company in those days, you've got full royalty in England and everywhere around the rest of it, you've got 50 percent. And I didn't understand that. I mean, it just didn't make sense. So I sat down with John and Tony and said, look, this is what we've got to do. First, if we get the deal, it's got to be excluding Canada, Japan and America. Now, EMI had never done that before and they weren't very happy. My recollection of that is for the first three albums they didn't get an advance but they got Canada, Japan and the USA. The, the publishing I didn't even got really involved in because the first album was mainly covers and Tony had booked Pi Studios at Marble Arch and I think we recorded it on a Saturday and mixed it on the Sunday. Um, which didn't cost them a lot of money in those days. It probably cost them a thousand, fifteen hundred pound. Meantime, I had a very good friend called Ben Nesbitt who ran Feldman's Publishing. And he had Bob Dylan's Publishing through a guy called Artie Mogul in America. And Artie Mogul had been brought in to run this record company in America called Tetragrammaton. And he phoned Ben and said, look, I started, we start this label. Get that tall skinny kid that I met who used to sit on your railings, radiator, to supply an act. So at that stage, we were doing the purple thing. So I got Tony and John in to see Ben. And I said to them, look, this man is honest, do your publishing with him. So Tony being what he always was, big-hearted man who was as tight as two coats of paint said yeah we'll give you a publishing if you give us 500 pound towards the pie recording and Ben said yes but I want two percent of the record and that's what happened is at that stage they got the best publishing deal that was being around at that time but from the records Feldman's got 2% of records. And through Ben, I met a guy called Louis Elman, who ran a company for Jacques Delaney Lee, which was studios. So we moved to another studio. Coming towards the end of the third album, I knew it was time for me to go. But to this day, they've never ever told me that I'm not doing the next album. I mean, I still resent it a little bit. No one ever had John, you know, I spoke to John and Tony about it and they went, oh, well, 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 you know, it was up to the band to tell you. I mean, Richie was my mate. The others were people I worked with. Before they both died, John and Tony both said they resented paying me a percentage. And I said to them, well, I resent you only giving me 1%. Because everywhere else I was getting 2, 3, 4%. And I did all your thing for you. And of course they went, no, 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 you didn't do any of that, we did all that. And he said, yeah, of course, yeah, all right. Every other week, John and I nearly come to blows. Um, because John was the one that suddenly thought he knew it all. But that's what made John, John. His enthusiasm for everything. Um, Tony... 
To me, Tony was never a music man, he was a businessman. Tony would go, oh, that's great, if he heard someone say that's great before him. John would have an opinion, it probably was never right, but he, he would have his own opinion. That was my feelings over those early years. Didn't talk to them for years. Tony and I would talk to every now and again. I'd phone up Tony and say, you know, aren't we earning money? What's, what's going on? And he'd go, oh, I don't know. I phoned John and he said, well, I'll, I'll talk to Dick and get him a century son, you, you know, whatever, which one? And in the later years, it was when John's wife Sherry was dying um, and someone told me and I phoned John and I said, look, I'm sorry, mate. I'm and he said, look, I'm coming to London. Let's meet and let's have dinner. We haven't spoke for years. So I ended up going to start in a studio in his house out in Marbella. And I used to go out for three weeks out of every five. Um, we never made any money. But as he said, just you know, not long before he died, but we had all these people out here and how come we didn't make any money? I mean, I took Rob Davis out of Mud, who then went on to write Kylie's Can't Get You Out of My Head and all that stuff. In fact, we were out in Marbella, in John's studio, in his bedroom, in his, one of his 12 spare bedrooms. The day the phone call came through and said, can't get you out of my head, it's number one in England. Um, but John being John, then he built another huge building down the garden for the studio. But that was John. Uh, but he become like a really, really good friend. Um, really good friend. Um, we'd argue from 1967 to the day he died, we argued. Um, Tony, I'd hear from him if he needed something, or he'd hear from me if I needed something. A business thing. Yeah. But we see each other. It seems to me that the band left it to the management, the management left it to the band. And it was like, uh, in America it opened a lot of doors. Um, I mean, if I think if you talk to most people, the two tracks that they always talk about is Smoke on the Water and Hush. And I'm very proud of Hush because I think that was a great rock pop single and I think that's what we were trying to do in those early days. Um, the Smoke on the Water, if you, you, you say to most people, Smoke on the Water, they sing you the guitar riff. But that's what to me probably became riffs. Brilliant riffs, but riffs. <laughs>